One day, my mother and father decided that they had had enough of life's worries and decided to take a vacation, so they made a dinner reservation at a nice restaurant. In the evening, they called a girl they knew and arranged for her to look after their children in their absence. When the babysitter arrived, the parents told her to feed the children and send them to bed. After that, you can just watch TV and get yourself something from the refrigerator, the father said. And if you don't mind, said the mother, could you watch TV in our bedroom? The kids have been having nightmares lately, so if you hear them crying, you can come in and soothe them. The nanny happily agreed, and the parents left for the restaurant. The girl gave the children milk and cookies, then took them to their bedroom. She read them a bedtime story, and soon, the boy and girl were sound asleep. The nanny turned off the light in their bedroom and went to watch television. When the nanny entered her parents' bedroom and sat down on the couch, she noticed that there was a creepy clown statue in the corner of the room. The girl tried to ignore it, but the statue looked so creepy and intimidating that a chill ran down the girl's spine. It seemed to her that the statue's eyes were looking directly at her. As time went on, Nanny began to feel more and more uneasy around the clown statue. Whenever she looked at it, it seemed to her that the statue was moving, only very, very slowly. Finally, the clown statue began to inspire her with such dread that she could no longer cope with her anxiety. The girl went down to the living room to the telephone. When she dialed her parents' number, the call was answered by her father. Hi, it's me, the babysitter said. Everything's fine. The kids are sound asleep, but I was wondering, can't I watch TV in the living room? Sure, the father replied. But why? I know it sounds silly, the girl laughed, but the clown statue scares me. A clown statue? asked the father. Yes, the clown statue is in your bedroom, replied the girl. The phone went silent for a moment. Listen to me very carefully, said the father. Take the children and get out of the house. I'm calling the police. Get out. Now. What happened? the girl asked. The father gulped and replied, We don't have a clown statue. For a moment, the babysitter was just stunned. Then she dropped the phone and ran upstairs grabbing the children. Holding the children under her arm in each hand, she rushed downstairs and ran out into the street. Standing on the sidewalk and comforting the small children, the nanny looked out the bedroom window and saw something that made her shriek with horror. In a gap between the curtains peered the pale face of a clown. He stared at her angrily, then slowly backed away into the darkness. In a few minutes the police arrived, and the officers, taking every precaution, entered the house. In an upstairs bedroom they found a man dressed in a clown costume. When they arrested him in the secret pocket of his clown costume, they found a knife. The clown turned out to be a mentally ill killer who had escaped from a mental institution. He had been living in the house for months, hiding from the family in the attic during the day and walking around the house at night. For weeks, the children had complained to their parents that the evil clown was coming into their room at night and disturbing their sleep by watching them. But the parents thought that these were just children's fears. A circus has come to town. A real circus. There are elephants and camels. There's a fortune teller, Jaria, and her assistant witches. Reading this ad, I wondered what the circus had come up with this time. The same troupe had come to our town many times before, and each time they came up with something new. They came to our town year after year to pay tribute to one of their artists, a clown of sorts, who was stabbed during a performance. The troupe buried him right there, not far from their performance dome. Not far from the dome was an unfinished building. Earlier they wanted to build a hospital there, but money was scarce, and construction was frozen. But the strangest thing began after the troupe left town. Children always played at the construction site. This place pulled them to themselves like a magnet as if someone invisible time after time called children to join him. As time went by, young people disappeared. And not only young people, everyone who went there disappeared. The kidnappings only ended when the troupe came back to town with a new performance. And now that everyone was in the tent, I decided to check out the construction site I had heard so much about. At the time, I thought that since today was the gig, I was safe. But I was wrong. As I made my way inside, I naturally felt uneasy. The shadows that played in the rays of my flashlight seemed like demons and ghosts. Every rustle seemed like a message, and every whiff of wind was a touch that made my hair stand on end. After looking around all three floors of the building, I realized that I had wasted my time, when suddenly I heard a scream. 
the shrill cry of a woman, which then changed to the rolling laughter of a man. He kept saying she was dead, old Jaria was dead. And then I realized. The circus had come to town not to make money or to check the grave of one of his comrades but to keep him mad. But no one could stop him now. The clown who had died on the stage was back on it. I couldn't move. But I knew that if I didn't, I would definitely stay here forever. I pulled out my flashlight and moved down the hallway toward the stairs, when suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something swift and fast. It swept by me, but I didn't feel a gust of wind. I began to descend, and on each of the floors I felt it. There was only one last floor left, and I was out. My heart was beating like never before, and I quickened my step as suddenly something turned me in the opposite direction of the exit. There he was, standing in front of me. He was wearing a blue and white suit, dirty and torn, makeup smeared across his face that made him look like the devil himself. And just below his neck was a throwing knife, with a dark stain around it. I looked right into the brat's face, and he looked at me. He smiled, and the smile exposed his yellow teeth. As I looked closer into his face, I saw that he was decomposing. Little white worms crawled in his cheek, and his right hand was missing two fingers. He moved on me, slowly and unhurriedly. He came right up to me and started to scalp me. I screamed and wriggled, but the clown didn't care. He kept tearing me apart. And when he was done with me, he started laughing. He laughed with that laugh that only clowns can laugh. You ask how I'm telling you this if I'm dead? Oh, it's very simple. The clown always sends me to tell stories to those he's coming for. I heard on the news today that there is a clown maniac in our area. There have been no casualties so far, but there have been repeated attempts to attack people. It's described as an ordinary clown, except his nose is black instead of red. What a stupid thing to say, I thought. Well, how can it be some nutcase dressing up as a clown and attacking people? The time was already 8.02 and I was late for the institute. Stupid news, it's making me late and I have to jolt on the bus for 15 minutes. I quickly put on my shoes and ran to the bus stop. After a few pairs, I arranged to meet my boyfriend. I was already in the elevator of his house. The elevator didn't inspire confidence, but after those couples, I wanted to get on the couch as soon as possible. So what if Kevin only lived on the fourth floor? So after pressing the call, the elevator doors opened. Stepping into the elevator, I pressed the fourth floor button as suddenly a man's voice was heard. Wait, stop! But the elevator had already gone, after which I heard a bang on the doors. And it was so strong that it echoed throughout the elevator, and the elevator staggered a bit. I got out of the elevator and walked briskly toward the guy's apartment. During this time, I heard quick footsteps coming up the stairs upstairs. I slammed the door shut and walked into the apartment. But Kevin wasn't there. A minute later, the doorbell rang. I freaked out, locked myself in my room, and started crying. My phone rang. It was a guy asking me to answer the door. The thing is, he decided to meet me at the elevator, but I ran out and locked myself in his room. I didn't tell him anything. Before I knew it, it was dark outside the window. We had a great time. I forgot about what happened at the elevator, and I got ready to go home. I walked down this time. Everything was as usual, but at the entrance I felt someone looking at me. I decided to stop and see if anything was wrong. I sat down, supposedly to tie my shoeless, and as soon as I untied it, I noticed a dorky silhouette. Hair kind of fuzzy, huge shoes. Oh my God, what is that? A nose, a clown nose. I ran as fast as I could, but my shoelace was untied. I fell and hit my head on the pavement. Waking up in my bed, I looked at the clock. 0758. How is that? How did I end up in my bed? I thought. After all, all I remembered was the horrible pain in my head. Getting out of bed, I went to the bathroom, but on the way, I walked into the kitchen. What was my surprise when I saw my boyfriend? Kevin, what? What are you doing here? 
How did you even get here? He started to tell me. When you said you were going alone, I was really surprised and decided to walk you out after all. Everything was fine, only at the entrance you sat down sharply and started digging in your sneakers. When you noticed me, you went crazy, flew like a bullet and fell at the threshold. I ran up. You were unconscious. That's when I decided to carry you home. I couldn't leave you in the street. And how are you? Before I could say the rest of my words, he interrupted me, and I found the keys in your pocket. Wow, I imagine that. Calming down, I went to wash up in the bathroom, and on the way, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the same black clown nose on the floor. That very second, the guy covered it with his foot and slowly pulled it under the chair. I guessed the whole thing and ran, slamming the door in passing. Kevin tried to explain to me that he'd found it, that he'd hid it so he wouldn't scare me but I didn't believe him and yelled at him to leave. At that moment, I heard soft, dwindling footsteps coming from the bathroom door. A minute later, a knife was stuck in the door. I started screaming frantically and decided to stay in there as long as possible. After a few pokes of the knife, a hole began to appear. Kevin's eye was looking out of it, only his face was white. The same red, fluffy hair was visible, and the shadows that peeked through the gap under the door showed the same giant shoes. The stabbing at the door continued. I sat down in the bathroom and clutched my eyes shut and began to cry for help, and even prayed. With a couple stabbings left, suddenly someone started kicking in the front door. A squad of police officers ran in and caught him, it turned out that a neighbor, a good acquaintance, heard screaming and banging, so she called the police, deciding to lie that she heard gunshots so that they came faster. As it turns out, sometimes lying is even useful. The guy, Kevin, turned out to be the maniacal clown. I still have no idea how I'm going to live with that.